This is September 18th, 2001. We're in Natick, Massachusetts. And this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates. We're privileged to have with us today Leo Doyle. Leo, how are you today? Fine. It's good to see you today. May I ask when you were born? February 24th, 1918. And that makes you 83, 83 years old. Right. And your current address? Medford, Massachusetts. And marital status? Married. How about children? Uh, six had six children. And seventeen gra grandchildren. <laughs> Eleven great grandchildren. So, yes. Is that right? Yeah. That's a wonderful family. Where were you born, Leo? Cambridge, Massachusetts. In Cambridge. And um, were you raised across the river there? Right near Harvard University, right in Kerry Corner. You were raised there, right the Harvard there as a Square. kid? Hmm? Tell us about growing up there as a, a little boy. Well, we were a sort of a close-knit Irish neighborhood. In fact, the name of it was Kerry Corner. And we grew up, hung together, played ball, did everything that youngsters did. We skated on the Charles River. Um, I guess it was sort of a poor neighborhood because everybody was the same, so we didn't know the difference whether we were rich or poor. You never knew you were poor. Never knew. Never knew it. What did your father do? My father was a bookbinder. He worked at uh, Cuneo Press uh, in what used to be Ginnon Company in Cambridge and then was sold out to Cuneo Press, so he worked there for 57 years. As a bookbinder. Bookbinder. That's a kind of rare skill these days, isn't it? It is today. We don't have too many of those binders no. left. And, and what about your mother? She had a family uh, to bring up. Did she? Uh, was she what we will call a homemaker? Oh yes, yeah. Um, most of the neighbors in in, a, in the neighborhood were all homemakers, and very few of them worked outside of the home. Those that did may have worked at Harvard University as cleaning women, cleaning up the students' rooms and whatever because of the proximity to Harvard University. Did your mother do any of that, uh, any affiliation um, with Harvard? No, she didn't, but she used to do a lot of sewing and whatever for the students that were at Harvard. The people that worked there knew that my mother could sew well, and so they used to bring things for her to to so, so augmenting a little bit of money for her, you know. And we used to have a room, an extra room in the house. We had eight rooms, so we always had a student, Harvard student, to go through there for four years while he was going to school. And occasionally when they came to their 25th anniversary, they came back to see my mother. So you had a, a, a pretty close affiliation with the university and university life uh, from your carry corner there? Yeah, because well, we That's knew we knew all the, the spots around. Eventually I went there, but that was another time after I came back from the service. Well, we're, we'll yeah. be sure and tell us about that. Mm -hmm. So what schools did you go to as, as a, a, a boy and as you grew up? Well, I went to St. Paul's Catholic School. That was a neighborhood school, and uh, from, then I went into Ringe Tech Technical School. Did you think to follow in your uh, father's footsteps, or what were you? Uh, well, I did. I went into the bookbinding. You became a bookbinder. Yeah. Well, and, and before that, I, when I got out of high school, I wound up in the CCCs, Civilian Conservation Corps. Most of the young fellows thank God for it at the time, because we were all hanging around. There were no jobs available. And so we went in there. I was in there for 14 months. For building. people who uh, are not as old as we are, uh, let's let's look at that for a minute. What it was? It was a, a an organization under the Roosevelt administration mm -hmm. to give jobs to people, meaningful jobs. You went out and worked and did things. Well, a lot of work involved in uh, infrastructure and things like that. What did you do? Well, this these were all young men. Uh, we went into the woods all over the country, built fire trails, built uh, dams, uh, built uh, recreation areas, uh, dammed the rivers for fishing, 
uh, we were opening up a lot of the area that needed to be opened up. Now, I wound up on the Green Mountain National Forest up in Vermont, and I was there at the time of the flood in, in 1937, I believe it was. In, uh, they sent a crew of us over to Brattleboro, Vermont area where the flood was, so I remember the havoc that was raised there when the farms were, were flooded out barns where cows had been killed in the barns and whatever, and that was an experience back then. It must have been. The, the idea behind it was we got $30 a month in wages, board and room, and $25 of that was sent home and we had $5 to spend ourselves. But between the, between the time you paid a dollar for this and a dollar for that, we had $2 a month to spend. So. But otherwise, it, it was the best experience. I didn't think so at the time, but it was the best experience in my life after I got out. Tell us, tell us about going to high school. High school? High school. Well, that was just four years of, of actually three years I went in the CCs, and then when I came out, I went, uh, I went and graduated after I got out. What year did you graduate from high school? 1937. 37. No, 1938. 38. 1938. 1938. 1938. And then what, what did you do after you got out of high school? I, you went into the CCC? Or the no, no, that was before. You'd done that. I, yeah. So what did you do? Did you get a job as a bookbinder? I did. I was, uh, became an apprentice um, in the bookbindery. Was it the first, same one your father had been in? Yeah, that, that's how I got out of the, when you were in the CCs, you stayed in there until you found a job, or somebody found a job for you, and then you were able to get out. Uh, and I, I stayed there, um, I, I was a lively, a life hood almost. I had, um, and let me see, I would have been 50 some odd years myself in the trade because I, in 1968, I became an international rep with the union and stayed in that until 1983 when I retired. So, from 1937 on up through. So, from 37 until you went into the service, you were a bookbinder. Mm -hmm. um, tell us where you were on December 7th, 1941. December 7th, 1941, I was in Iceland, Reykjavik, Iceland. We had um, we'd taken a load of marine, uh, um, we were on a cargo ship, a Navy cargo ship, and we, our, we had a load of telephone poles and communication gear that the Iceland was at the time. Oh, that, well, oh. excuse me, Leo, let me back off. I, I've already put you in the service before uh, your time here. Okay. You joined the service in April of, of 41. 41, yeah. Okay, uh, excuse me for jumping ahead there. Why did you join the service in April of 41? Well, we were called, I was in a, a, a six months previous to that. We, and, uh, we were called out on April, that I was in the Naval Reserve. Ah. And the reason I went in the Navy, I didn't want the Army. I wanted no, I had no idea of sloshing through Germany or wherever with a gun over my shoulder. So I joined the Navy, and that was my reason for being in the Navy. Why, right but why did you go into the, into the service at all? You had a job? Well, I would have been drafted. You know, when the draft yeah. came, uh, uh, and so I had a choice. I picked the branch of service I wanted. You picked to go the one to. that you wanted. At the time you went in, did other guys that you knew, uh, either from school or your job, go into the service? Oh, they were all in. All my crowd were in. In 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 the early, army, the navy, in marine early corps. 1941. 1941. Yeah. So this they got drafted. Oh. Uh, yeah. Quite a few of them. A lot of them wound up in the. Uh, 182nd Infantry, which was a National Guard unit, and eventually became the Americal Division over in New Caledonia in, in the Pacific. Well, that is the only 
uh, regiment in the army that didn't have a number or a division, the American Division, which was made up of the 182nd in Massachusetts National Guard, the 132nd from Chicago, Illinois, and the 164th Infantry from uh, Bismarck, uh, from North Dakota. And that comprised the American Division. Tell us uh, specifically about uh, going into the Navy. Where did, where did you go in? Through Boston? Through Boston. And uh, where, where were you sent after you Well, joined? we went right on board the, um, the text. Um, in fact, I was working Friday in a book bindery. Friday night I got a policeman came to the door and asked if I was Leo Doyle and I said yes. He said, you're to report to the Navy Yard tomorrow morning at 0800. At 0800 we went over there, spent the day. They sent us home, told us to say goodbye to everybody. Report back Sunday morning at 0800, which we did. Later that afternoon we were on our way to Newport, Rhode Island. The next morning we were at sea on the USS Texas. That's how fast I went in. What about training? Huh? I didn't have that much. We were as green as grass to be to be active. To, you, you we did. were in the reserves. Yeah. I was. I had a second battalion reserve unit, uh, but a lot of us had only a few weeks of uh, weekend. You go one night a week, I believe it was then, and that's all we had. Whatever they tried to do for us, uh, they had uh, a building that had a wheel that looked like a ship, and this is a ship, and whatever. But that's, that's the extent of our training. When we got on board the Texas, again, as green as grass, they had no place, they had no bunks or anything. They didn't have bunks for us, so we wound up slinging a hammock, first time in our lives that we ever did that. And it was quite, if, if they could have only had a tape of that, it would have been a real comical affair, I'll tell you. Where was, where was the ship? Where was the It was, was in Newport, Rhode Island, the USS Texas. Now, the is this battleship. the battleship Texas? Mm -hmm. And it was sitting out there in Newport, Rhode Island, and you went aboard it with a bunch of other green horns. As some of them had some time in the reserves, yeah. but most of us were fairly new. We were only in maybe four or five months. Was the Texas being used that time as a, as a training ship? No, it wasn't. Um, it went right up through the North Atlantic. Uh, we had heard at the time that they were looking for that room, as of course, the, that um, German battleship that was sunk off of Rio de Janeiro that time. The Graf time. Spee. Hmm? The Graf Spee. Yeah. And uh, the understanding was that we knew where it was and told somebody, you know, that, but they were rumors. We didn't know, but we were supposed to have spotted it. On board the Texas, um, was that where it was decided what kind of job you would have in the Navy? No, actually, where I was a, being in, in a short time, I was only an apprentice uh, seaman. And that's what I was when I went on board. And we only stayed on there for two months. And they put us on a gun crew. And we did train on the anti aircraft gun. The, uh, three inch, I believe, and that's what we did. We were assigned to that, and pretty much all we did was spray paint and then paint it again on Friday and scrape it on Monday, and because there were so many of us on there. But we only lasted for that two months we were out, and then we um, went to boot camp. We were only in boot camp two weeks. I don't know why they sent us there because you can't really go to boot camp after you've been in the service for a period. Where was boot camp? And it was in, in Newport, Rhode Island. Yeah, it's, they, uh, it's getting warm in here because of the lights. Perhaps you'd like to take your hat off now? Yes, thank you. That's fine. Uh, well, actually, uh, when we went to Port Newport, Rhode Island, they, did, they didn't know what to do with us there, so they but they had us in boot camp. They had us long enough to cut our hair off. And two weeks later, or three weeks later, we wound up being assigned to the, uh, the uh, El Chiba, the USS El Chiba, a cargo ship. 
in Boston. We commissioned it there. And we were, again, we had, we had no training on cargo ships. We got all our training working at the job. This business that you had done on the Texas um, with anti-aircraft guns, was that gone now? You're not, you weren't going to do that anymore? Uh, no, we were assigned the guns on board our own ship, but we were deckhands loading cargo, unloading cargo, and I was in the uh, deck division at the time. Describe this ship. You've got the name of it there on your shirt. Uh, what kind of a ship would you call it? Um, it's a, a cargo ship? Just a cargo. Uh, it was the, uh, originally the Mormac Dove line. That was the name of the Mormac Dove, McCormick line, and the Navy took it over. And then our, our crew was assigned there, and I believe there was another um, um, reserve unit from Indiana that made the crew. The, uh, 125 of us, 125 of them, and that was that was the crew for the El Chaber. So there were 250 members of Roughly the crew. Roughly 250 men on and, board. And was the ship also at Newport? No, this was in <clears throat> Boston when we commissioned it. Okay. Yeah. And did you take off from there and sail yep. away? The first trip we had with with them was uh, we went down to uh, Charleston, South, South Carolina, and we picked up Marines to take up to Iceland. Uh, on the way up, um, on October 31st, 1941, we were with the Reuben James when it was sunk, the destroyer. There was. Did you, did you did you actually see that? I was on I was on watch at the time on the on the on the wheel watch at the time that it was hit. We saw the explosion. We saw it. It was off, not that far off on our starboard side when it was hit. Can you describe what you saw? Well, actually, that we just saw the explosion. We just kept right on going, but um, we were we had 53 ships in this particular con uh, convoy that we left to Genesee and Newfoundland, and we were only as fast as the slowest ship. Yeah. So we were only doing about five knots, of, you know, a mile. So we weren't doing too fast. We just bouncing on the waves on the way up. And we lost a number of ships, cargo ships, before we hit Iceland, only because if they had any trouble in the engine room or they, they had to leave the convoy for whatever reason, that night they'd, the, uh, you'd see a blast in the sky, and that's another one that was sunk. Now, be, be very clear here, this is before Pearl Harbor. Right. This is before the United States officially uh, entered the war. I think the destroyer deal had been made at this time. Yep. Fifty destroyers for England. It was but the first ship sunk. Who? The Germans were firing. Now these are American ships. Some of them, at least. We were five. There were five destroyers in the convoy. American ships. And we were right in about in the middle of this particular convoy, and they were escorting us, so-called, up to Iceland. Don't forget, at that point in time, there was no convoying going on, supposedly. Mm -hmm. So you can see what, they were protecting us, but in the meantime, there happened to be 52 other ships along with us. But they were there to protect us. So that's then, of course, on that, October evening, that's when the Reuben James got sunk, and they lost most of their crew in that setting. We, we of course, kept right on going. We didn't know what happened at the time, but we heard later they lost most of their crew. Now, were you sailing up to Reykjavik? Is that where you were going? Mm -hmm. Tell us about your first look at Iceland, and uh, what did you do there? Just discharge your cargo, or what? We were discharging uh, telephone poles. Uh, because they were again, they were making, they were setting up a communication system across uh, Iceland, and the British were there in uh, cells. And the f fact was, I guess, that they thought that the Icelandic people were pro-Nazi uh, and they or German, and they didn't want them to set up a sub base in Iceland. 
So that's why we went in and actually took it over, I believe. I don't think we were that, that much welcomed there, but we were there. And we were there until we unloaded our supplies and uh, headed back to the States. When you unloaded your supplies, did you have to hang around and wait for other ships? You didn't we came convoy back alone. Back by yourself. No destroyer, you no, uh, <clears throat> we didn't even take ballast on, which is when you unload a ship and you're empty, they usually take on water and then I'd take the water out when they get where they're going. But we went back empty and that, we got in a storm on the way back for Must three have been days. Some ride. That, oh. It was one horrible experience, I'll tell you. Because we were like a matchstick in the middle of an ocean. Where did you go back to? New York. New York. This, this is about October or November of 41. Mm -hmm. and, w and what happened in New York? Did you get another c cargo, another Oh Convoy. yeah. Uh, well, we uh, we had some work done in Bayonne, New Jersey, and then we headed down to um, uh, South Carolina again, Charleston, and we were working with the Marines uh, on their training of landing, which they later did at Guadalcanal. But that's what they were training at the time, and we were their ship. We had so many Marines on board and they were going down the cargo nets and heading for the beach and they were in training for an invasion at that time. And then we took them um, through the canal. And about out how many guys, uh, Marines, uh, did you take on board and did you take their equipment as well? Artillery, uh, all the stuff that a, a group would bring along? That's like what that. we had. We had uh, anything that they would need at that moment in time, with in the, all the gear that they had. There were probably as many Marines on board as there was uh, Navy personnel, and because they had, they built in one of the holes, they had bunks for them. It wasn't the best conditions, I'll tell you, in which to be living, and um, the water was scarce on board a cargo ship, so they didn't get the we had fresh water showers occasionally, but they had, they had salt water showers all the time. I want to be very clear about the time here. Um, we still haven't come to Pearl Harbor, and Guadalcanal was uh, August of 42. Right. So where were these Marines going? They, they were training, as I say, then. Yeah. Uh, uh, they were, eventually we took them to... Um, um, Wellington, New Zealand. That's where they first went. Where were you when the war broke out, Leo? We were in Iceland. You uh, back, up, back up at Iceland? Yeah. When war was declared, we were in yeah. Iceland. In December 7. Tell, can you tell us uh, how you heard it and what your reaction was to this? Well, actually, the reaction was we, well, we didn't think was the war was going to last too long that we didn't realize what the enemy was like at the time. We, we actually felt we were going to go and take care of them right away until we found out later that how many of the battleships that we lost and cruisers and destroyers in Pearl Harbor. We didn't get that till a little later. Of course, we were ready to go, let's go, you know, sure. and all this, but uh, we found out that they were, they weren't the enemy we thought they were, I mean, as, as far as their, uh, when they came to manning their ships, they were good at what they did also. Oh, and so now you're making, where, where did you go out of Iceland now? Back down to... Well, we uh, went with the training, and then when we got through the training, uh, we did go into Miami for a little rest and recreation. That was a nice trip after they did their training. And I think there's a picture of that in the pictures that I... Oh, that's good. Gave. Uh, and uh, then we came back and we picked up the first Marine, Div some of the first Marine Division that were assigned to our ship, and then we headed for uh, through the through the canal and out into the Pacific. Can you tell us, with all these Marines on board, and say you're going that's the trip that went through the uh, canal and then out into the Pacific? What was a kind of a typical day on board your ship? 
What did you do, and what did the rest of the crew do? Well, it was just like a little town. Everybody had a job to do, and I wound up, uh, I wound up running the ghee dunk stand. I ran the, I made ice cream on board ship. That was my job. What, what, what did you call it? Ghee dunk. Ghee dunk? Now, now what ghee dunk means, I ghee don't dunk. know, but it's ghee dunk. And, and you, you made it. to any Navy, any sailor, he knows what ghee dunk is, ice cream. Did you make the ice cream? Yep, yep, yep. Now, where in the world did you learn to make ice cream? Well, that's a story in itself. I heard we were getting a, an ice cream machine, and so I heard the Alhenna, which was a cargo ship like ourselves, was tied across from us in Charleston, South Carolina, and they had an ice cream machine on board. So, so you I went over and looked at so it. So I yeah. used to take the trash down to the dock, they didn't miss me. I'd go up on the other ship, and then I asked if I could go see the ice cream machine. And they said fine, and I went down, and I asked the young fellow who was the, making the ice cream if I could watch him, because I said, we're getting a, a machine on board our ship, and I'd like to know how to run it. And he fine. So every day for about a week, I'd go over and help him, and then I he let me run it, and I, I got so I could do the job in about two weeks. Then I saw my executive officer, and I told him, I said, Pappy Shore, and I said, Pappy, I think I, uh, I I can run the ice cream. He says, What do you mean you can run it? I said, oh, We had one of those up in my neighborhood. So, in Harvard Square, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, he when we, when it came on board, he says, "Hey, Doyle, come up here." He says, "The machine is here." He says, "I'm going down to watch you, see what you can do." So I went down. It was the same type of a machine that was on the other ship. I set it up, made the first five gallons. He said, "Son of a gun, you can run it, can't you?" So yeah, that was my job. And at that time, there was no rate for. Uh, like uh, laundrymen, uh, barbers. Uh, we got a sort of a commission on whatever the money was that we took in. So later on they came out with a ship service rating. But at that time, all, all of those jobs, like a carpenter, um, not a carpenter, but a uh, laundryman and, uh, and myself and whatever job, those type of jobs, there was no rating for them. What, of the rest Everybody of Everybody had a job is what I'm saying. My job was to make ice cream. Is, is that now what you did on this ship? Every the, day. Every day, yeah. all day long? No, no, we stood watches like everyone else did, but during the day I'd make ice cream, you know, for the next day sell it at noontime and start making it right away. That's why it was one of the best jobs in the Navy, to be honest with you, you know, if could you, you had to have a job. Could you tell us, did you eat your own ice cream? Did I eat my a own? A lot of ice cream? Oh, sure. In fact, while we're on this subject, we got the idea, I said to, to um, some of the guys, because the only ice cream we had was chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry with a powder mix. And so I said, gee, if we could get some of that fruit that we load on board the ship, it would be kind of nice. So we were loading supplies to go someplace, and they brought, um, the guys got a hold of some of the fruit and it wound up in my locker upstairs in the ice cream. Just by coincidence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just happened to <clears> that. <throat> and the first time I decided to make it, I happened to take the pineapple. Instead of pouring the juice off, I poured it in with the mix. Well, <laughs> needless to say, we had probably the first slush that was to generate, but it worked. Uh, I, I was concerned, what am I going to do? But anyway, everybody loved it. So, the, But the next batch I made happened to be cherry ice cream, cherries. So I poured the juice off, put the cherries in, and from then on we had fruit cocktail ice cream, plum ice cream, we had any ice cream, any kind of a fruit, we had ice cream for it. So, so and you, the executive officer, <laughs> old Pappy Shaw, uh, he was a great, great, one of the best officers you could serve under, he loved his ice cream. 
And I can almost truthfully say the only locker in the Navy that was never examined was the locker where my ice cream was stored. Because he didn't want to know what was in there, and I didn't want him to see what was in there, and we got along fine. That was the origin of ask not and tell not in the Navy, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> You're on a shipload of Marines now going over into the what is now the war area. Um, where did you touch it? Did you touch into Pearl, or where did you go? So we, we, drive, we went over to New Zealand, left the Marines there, and we headed back to the States, but we went to, to Antofagasta, Chile, and picked up a load of copper. And uh, we brought the... Uh, uh, no, we came back to the States, and I'm ahead of myself, we came back to the States after we left the, Mar the Marines off, and uh, we picked up... Um, Where did you take the Marines to? We took the Marines to New Zealand. Yeah. We came back to the States and we picked up an Army unit and we brought them to Bora Bora. Actually, Bora Bora was probably the first island that we started with. And they didn't, weren't sure whether that was... We went in there with an old four-stack cruiser and an old destroyer with uh, two cargo ships. And... Um, when we got in there, they were wondering if it was free French or Vichy French. And they had a French frigate out in the harbor, and up went the free French flag. So this we had is no part of the greater there. Tahiti, is that correct? Yeah, Bora yeah. Bora, the, the, uh, what, the islands there, the group, Tahiti group. Uh, but anyway, we left them there and then went to uh, uh, Bora Bora, uh, went to uh, and if a gas to Chile, got a load of copper and brought that up to uh, New York, which we loved because the longshoremen handled the unloading of it, and we were all able to go on liberty while they were doing the work that we normally would have done. So you got ho uh, home, uh, or did you just... Some did. I, yeah. I didn't at the time. Um, Had uh, you been home in any time uh, between some of these... Uh, cruises that you were on? When we came back from Iceland, I got home for three days. We were all, you know, it was close to Boston. And uh, we didn't get home again. While we are in Boston, no, when we were in Boston for a while there, you know, in New York. But I never, that was the last time I got home for, for a couple of years. Other than your, your travel in the CCC, um, you're really getting to see some of the world now, aren't you? You you, you got what the Navy promised you, join the yeah, we, Navy and see the world. We, we started in Iceland. That was a dreary place. They weren't that very friendly there. You were asking me about Iceland. Yeah. And that we, we went over there, but nobody would speak to us. And the women and the girls who were over there couldn't talk to us because they would be ostracized if they did, I guess that's the word. And so we did, we, it wasn't a friendly place. To me it wasn't when we were there. Uh, we outnumbered probably the, the, what the troops are all around the place maybe. But yeah. uh, we, we left, it, that was Iceland to me. It was long days with the sun, the daytime I remember, you know, and cold. Uh, the ship was uh, had ice all over it, and some when we get a mist sometimes, and then you get ice all over everything. We were kind of glad to get away from there. This is very different from the Pacific now. Uh, oh yes, you, the, you were last in New York. Did you uh, pick up another cargo, and you're on your way out somewhere? That's when we left there. That's when we picked up. We've always were carrying Marines, so we brought more Marines out to the Pacific, and then we part of their uh, um, their group. We left we left New Zealand. We went to New Caledonia, and then from there uh, New Hebrides. No, New Caledonia, and then we picked up the first Marine there, and uh, we headed into Guadalcanal to make the invasion. Of okay, that's August of '42. Now, at, at any time prior to that, uh, had you guys been attacked by subs or? Japanese air power? Uh, no. What, what did you see of the war around no, you? No, we were just, we were, 
the war had started after he came back from Iceland, and we never saw the. We had supposedly sub scares occasionally, but we never saw anything, and we never had any uh, uh, attacks from any planes until we hit Guadalcanal. Generally, were you traveling uh, with other ships, with any uh, escorts? Most of the time. The only time we weren't alone was the time that we came back from Iceland mm. and into New York because we had to get back and, and like I said, we, we were alone. And from then on, we went down the coast alone. We even went in through the intercoastal waterways that they were using at the time it was quite an experience. You were going through people's backyards. Yeah. They were how close you were to them. <clears throat> it's, it's a very and, lovely and ride. I forget yeah. now where we came out, but we did that twice. And uh, then we went out, then we went to the Pacific and we were out there all the time, you know. And when, we, in the larger view, what fleet were you attached to? Is this the seventh fleet or uh, the... T.I. We were with... Um, Turner, Admiral Turner was Kelly the, Turner is this? was the one that was in charge of us. The, that number escapes me. That's was, okay. Talk to us about Guadalcanal. Now you were part of the first well, we were offensive the first invasion. We, in, in, we went in into war. Guadalcanal in the morning. Surprised us because we thought we were. We didn't. We expected more at that moment when we went in, but I. We we were we actually surprised them. That's almost hard to believe, but we did, because the Marines had no, not too much opposition. They had more opposition in Tulagi than they did on Guadalcanal. They were which is an island across to the across east, the yeah. bay from it. Yeah, but <clears throat> they had they had a pretty good battle over there. But they were fortunate, at least in landing, to get on to. Uh, because the Japs left their kitchen, they were eating at the time, but they left everything and took off. What was your job when the Marines were going ashore? What what did you do? We were we were manning the guns. I was a gun talker actually on the with the uh, gunnery officer. Tell us what a gun talker is. Well, whatever guns they wanted fired, I would relay that message to the gun crews. Starboard side, fire, port side, whatever orders I got, I related to the the gunnery officer was in charge of firing. Yeah. What were you shooting at? Uh, planes, Japanese planes. We had at one time we that time we had uh, let me see, 21 bombers come in at us. They didn't get they didn't get one of us, but we we knocked down that is the crew that was in there, the ships who were in there, I think we got 19 of them out of the 23 really? that came in. And they were right beside us, you could see the tires, that's how low they were coming through. Actually, this was important because we were underway at the time because we knew they were coming. And we were, uh, whatever direction, whether we were north or south, <coughs> uh, we were all of a sudden, the captain, as he saw the planes come, he gave a, a left rudder. Now we're not the target we were before. And so they got caught. They were down. They couldn't change. They were coming at us. Now they only had us at length. They didn't have us on the side. So that was one of the things, I guess. And then when, when they were coming through, they were coming right in between our ships. And we were able to fire at them. I think we got credit with knocking three of them down. That, at least that's what the Navy gave us credit for. Because we had three stars or three uh, stripes that we had, you know, for knocking down enemy planes. As part of the invasion of, of Guadalcanal, it's my recollection that um, about on the first, second, or third day, the fleet withdrew. Yeah, we had to get they, out. We had to get out of there because... Could you talk to us about that? Actually, the second night we were there, October, and let me see, we landed August the 7th. August the 9th, there was the battle out off of Savo Island. That was the night that the Quincy, the Vincennes, and the Astoria, and the Canberra were sunk. But the 
we thought at the time that we were engaging the, the enemy and we thought we were kicking the hell out of them. But those were cruisers you just named. Yeah, so heavy Very cruisers. serious those losses. Those were the big ones. Yeah. They were our protection, outer protection in the harbor. The next, well anyway, they took off after they did their damage, after they sunk the ships. Hell, if they'd have come in, there was nothing really to stop them. There were a couple of destroyers inside. Maybe a light cruiser was inside, but that's all. I mean, that would have been a, you know, but they were afraid of the airfield of Henderson Field. So they took off as soon as they did the damage outside. They didn't hang around to come in because then they would have been sitting ducks from our Air Force probably. But did you sail away with uh, the other No, ships? not at that point in time because we went out the next morning to tow the Astoria. Our, our captain was a volunteer and captain. When, he, when it hit the fan, we were we were there, I guess. But anyway, he volunteered to <clears throat> tow them. And now this is this the is, Astoria was still a float. float the this next is a morning. cruiser badly damaged, the, and the, you guys, your captain, volunteered you. The Quincy, the Vincennes, and the Astoria, uh, the Quincy, Vincennes, and the Canberra was sunk. They were not there when we went out the next morning. The uh, Astoria was still afloat. And so we put, uh, we got out there and they put a cable over. We went out there with a destroyer, the Bagley, and we put a, we put a, um, uh, a line over to the, to the cruiser. It was a cable line. And just as we did that and we were, we just started to tow it when all of a sudden there was an internal explosion within the Astoria. Whether the, oil, whether the engine room or power or whatever, but they had an explosion and it sunk right in front of us. It turned over, it didn't go down bow or stern, it turned right over keel down and just floated down and, and you, you talk about the, like the you, people cried the other day when that, you know, the bomb hit, when those planes hit. There were teary eyes out there when that cruiser went down. You just couldn't believe it to see it go down. Then the captain, our captain, uh, uh, told us to get the lifeboats over. And so myself and Viggy were in one of them, I know, and we went down and we were picking up survivors. And just at that moment, while we were picking them up, they had a sub scare. And the destroyer and our ship took off. And we were out in rowboats with survivors, and the ships are leaving us. That was sort of a, <laughs> a new feeling when you're off of Savo Island in the rowboats with survivors. What were your feelings? This is a, a, a great story. What, what did you feel that half a century ago or even further? Well, you, actually, your ship is leaving. We knew that, I guess we knew they'd come back, but it was funny. It was to be out there alone with the enemy all around you, and these were fellows that we had to get out, they lost most of the crew. Heck, I think we only, the destroyer, the Bagley, I guess, picked up of 300, we only had about 100 and some odd, so the cruiser was probably 2,500, then maybe 3,000, so they lost. And the sad part, and we didn't, really, we didn't think of it at the time, only we were picking up the live survivors. You know, you know, and the others were floating by you. That's, that's not a nice spot to be in at the time because we were out to find out if we could get anyone that did survive. <clears throat> how many guys, do you remember, the, how many did you pull into your particular boat? Probably the lifeboat held quite a few. We got as many in as we could, yeah. Were there others that couldn't be pulled in? Not well, we had boats? more than one and the destroyers were picking them up too. So that we got everybody that was everybody that was out there alive, we we got. Okay. You know, and then they, the ships come back then, and we uh, uh, got them on board our ship, and they then we got them back in the Guadalcanal, and then they left the ship, and wherever they went afterwards, I don't know, but they 
Uh, just recently, I just telling a young lady, what's her name that was here? Barbara. Barbara? Yes. Uh, the story to read, I got a letter from a young seaman who was on board the Astoria thanking our ship. This is 59 years later, thanking us for what we did for him at the time that the ship sunk. This kid, Martin, Floyd, Lloyd Martin his name was, he, he um, was 17 years old. He was the youngest sailor on board the Astoria. He was in the water with no life jacket and he couldn't swim. And the only thing that was holding him up was a canister or a casing from one of the, maybe an eight inch shell or maybe the five inches they had on board. Now I don't know whether we picked him up or not, but I, I returned the letter. I, I answered the letter. And how did how did you get this letter? Or how did well, we're how having you? a ship's reunion, and the fellow that runs the reunion received the letter, and he sent it to me because I was on board at the time. He wasn't, and he thought it'd be nice if I answered the guy, which I did. Now I'm waiting for a reply back, and I told him what happened to our ship later, how we got torpedoed and the whole thing. And when I did get the letter, I'm telling you, I felt, here it is 58, 59 years later, I get this letter. The wife answered the letter saying, my husband was thrilled when he received your letter. Unfortunately, he passed away in his sleep on August the 10th. So I know. The 17 year old boy. Yeah. No, I never got to, I never got him to answer what happened to him. I told him what happened to us. That's what I was kind of waiting for. Never, but I'm awfully glad I wrote the letter anyway because at least he got to read and I reply to too. him. You know. While you were out there in your boats off of Savo Island and before your ships came back, were, were you attacked at all? Any no, we were just waiting. We were just waiting. Just looking at your watches and thinking they're going to come back. Yeah, when are they coming? Did they literally go out of sight and yep. they, they took yep. off over the horizon? Yeah. Yep. Back toward Guadalcanal or out no, to the up, open up sea? No, up the sea. The, yeah. They were after, they went that way, the destroyer went that way and the, our ship went that way. Wherever they, the destroyer evidently told them haul the other way, yeah. which they did. And But anyway, they came back and picked us up. But I and guess, then you and you, you brought did, this survivors. It's funny how you do things. You you, you do things that, that I guess you're trained to do it. Evidently, you just do it. Somebody has to do it, and so there you are in a boat with rowing, and you and you acted instinctively, down. and you took the survivors back to Guadalcanal. Mm. Not the friendliest place in the world to be. No, but we were we we got hit on our fifth. We got torpedoed on our fifth trip in there, I think it was. And all we had on... Do I understand you, you made five trips into Guadalcanal? Yeah. Yep. And where did you go in the meantime? For more supplies? More supplies. Where to? Uh, New Hebrides. And then you're bringing them back in? See, the Merchant Marine um, couldn't go in or didn't go into the war zone. They brought it as close as they could. They were, they were in the zone, but I mean, they didn't bring it down to where the, uh, where the fighting actually was, was uh, going on. Now this is your ship, and you're on your fifth trip, mm -hmm. and you're torpedoed? Yeah. And did, did you know did any inkling? Did you have any warning? No. Tell us, uh, where were you? And, uh, tell us about the experience. Well, when I first got hit, we were in the morning. Uh, we were just doing our right. We were unloading the ship at the time when the torpedo hit. And it hit number two hull. And it was loaded, that number two hull was loaded with uh, aviation, gasoline, small arm ammunition. You were stopped, you were, you were not even sailing. You were, you were we anchored. We were anchored. We were anchored. You were anchored and you were torpedoed? Hmm? And you were torpedoed? Yeah. Well, the we Japanese anchored. had come in that close? Uh, yeah, they had a midget sub, they had midget subs out there, and our understanding was a midget sub that got us that then. The captain found out we had power in the engine room, and even though the ship was beginning to list, he hauled up 
weighed anchor or hauled the anchor in and headed for the beach and drove the, the ship right up on the beach. Wait, did you have a fire? If this is roaring, the fire it was yeah. the same. It was the same, I believe, uh, if I'm correct. It was the same time that Boston had the Coconut Grove fire, November 28th, 1942. So we had our own. We were a Boston uh, Navy crew, and there were 125 of us on board. The second torpedo hit us seven days uh, on December the 7th while we were on the beach. They didn't want any of that stuff. The Marines needed ammunition so bad, they needed uh, bombs so bad. If they hit us a number four hole, we had 500 pound bombs in there. Anyway, we got, I would say we had it emptied by the time we got the second torpedo. You guys got to put the fire out? Yeah, well we had a, uh, we also had help from Navy tugs. They were alongside pouring water in too. But they found out through the ship that you need foam. And so then they learned, and next time they, everybody had foam to fight. At that time, we were just and, fighting and, with And water. you were beached. Now your ship is beached. And it's got a big hole in it, I take yep. it. And, but you got unloaded everything for the Marines. Mm -hmm. w did you get the ship back into the, the water? What happened then? Well, I, the second one, I got hurt. And so I left you the were, ship. That's when did, I left that ship. But they torpedoed it again while it was on the beach. That's when I got. That's when I got hurt. Tell December. us about that, would you? Well, I I just came out of my ice cream shack. It was, it was uh, early morning, and I was talking to the officer of the deck. Actually, I was sitting on a hatch. Uh, and he said, while I was talking to him, he said, Doyle, look. I turned around and looked and I saw the wake. It was too late. Of course, I went up. And like I say, I, I didn't get flight pay while I was up either, but I went up high. How high I went up, I don't know. But I do remember this. I remember going by the radio shack, and I remember Kemick, the radio in second class, came out of the radio shack as I was going by, and the radio shack was up another deck. Up. So I went up beyond him, how high up. You were literally blown into the air. Yeah, because everything that was on the hatch covers all went up. And I was sitting on them when I went up. And I, and I went up and uh, all that debris came down and they thought I was under it. And whatever happened, the thing that saved my life was the fact that the, when I landed on the deck, the stuff came down uh, some beam or something may have come down or one of the pontoons from the cargo, but it, it it fell against the ladder that used to be there. And I was underneath that. It had that landed flat. I wouldn't be talking to you right now because of, they, they, they were digging, throwing the stuff to find me underneath there because the officer of the deck knew that I was, that I, he thought I was there. And they found me up on, um, forward and uh, I got up, there was no ladder there, but I was on that next deck up and that's, I collapsed forward and that, that's where they found me. This was exactly a year after Pearl Harbor, is that correct? Yeah, that's why I remember the date well. And you're pretty badly wounded or hurt. Well, I was in the hospital for about 11 months. Yeah, I broke my back. And but where did they I, take you from Guadalcanal? From Guadalcanal I went to uh, New Hebrides to New Caledonia, got on the Solus. The, you were on a hospital ship. The uh, hospital ship. Yeah. Took us to uh, Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, that's when they put the cast on in Auckland, New Zealand. Up to that time, I, I, it was just a stretcher case. They put the cast on in Auckland, and then we had to wait for transportation back to the States. Yeah. What about the man who was talking to you and other members of your crew? Well, the, he survived. He was all right because he hid in the, he went into the, he went that way, which was into the, the um, oh, what do you call it, the um, passageway. And I've met him since. He thought I was dead. 
the la one of the reunions I went to, he said, I thought you were gone, Doyle. I always thought that you died. But uh, I said, no, I'm still real. I said, I always, if you'd have said jump, I might not have, have jumped with you. But I said, you told me to look, I said, and I looked and I saw the wake and it was too late. But anyway. What yeah. about your ship? What uh, happened to your ship? The ship was the only ship declared sunk by both countries. It was declared sunk by our own country. USS Altiba sunk in operations off the Solomon Islands. It wasn't sunk. The Japanese declared it sunk. It was later, they put a, uh, the Navy put the plates on the side of it, welded underwater, pulled it off, brought it to Tulagi. They put the engine back, got it going again, came back to the States, put back in service, back out to the Pacific again. Really? A tough old bird? Huh? A tough ship? Yeah. Well, it was the only that we know of. It's the only uh, uh, auxiliary ship in the Navy with the presidential unit citation. That particular cargo ship. And they tell me, I wasn't on board then. I, once I got off, I was, that was the end of me for there. But they tell me that when that used to pull in the port, the guys used to love it, because I knew some friends who were still on it. And it, the presidential citation flew under the, the ensign. In you know, in the Navy, you salute ships when you go into a port. And the higher the ranking ship, the higher the rate, you know. Well, as this cargo ship would come in, every, all the attention bugles would blow, and the wagons and cargo and carriers would be saluting the cargo ship coming in. They said they used to love that. That's a great distinction. It would be. I, I'm sorry I wasn't on that. Yes, I am you know? too. But they said, yeah, that used to really. Uh, surprise those. They were always probably wondering, what the hell is that? What, what kind of a ship is that? Why are we saluting that ship? But that's, that, that was our ship. And so has, I, he, hey, has anybody written a book about this? Uh, right now there's a fellow from Texas, that, um, a, um, well, let me see, um, from Texas, a professor, uh, is uh, writing a book. He thinks it should have been a play or a movie, but he's writing a book about with, the with James Cagney, right? Uh, so yeah, yeah. Like we we were like when you, if you saw Mr. Roberts, you That's saw the, the cargo one. ships. That's the one. That's the way we were. Well, usually the the, sh the picture made it very clear. It was dull work. Yeah. But not for you. No. Not for you at all. But no, it was. Uh, we found out, or at least I read a book later after the war was over, sometime later, my son happened to come across a book and, uh, about Guadalcanal. Uh, documentation of sort of. We, we didn't know at the time that we were expendable. They figured we were gonna, that we weren't gonna make it. You know, the different cargo ships. They figured odds that we were gonna have, you know, get hit. And we did, we did. But we were fortunate. We, uh, you know, any time loss of life is one thing, but we only lost, we say only, I don't mean that. I mean, in numbers, we only lost three. And we had eight of us wounded. And probably the reason for that is that, it, that there were like only about 31 of us on board. We volunteered to stay on. The rest of the crew was over in Guadalcanal. You, know. you you last told us that uh, you were, uh, what, 11 months in hospitals? Mm -hmm. Where was that largely? Well, I, I wound up in, um, I wound up in Oak uh, Knoll Naval Hospital in, in um, Oakland, California. And then before I went back into the service, I was in Santa Cruz, California, the Million Dollar Hotel, the recreation area, you know, the, it was like living like a king. You had a room and they fed you. There was no Navy cooks or anything. It was, it was, but that, they should never have sent me there because I thought I died and went to heaven for, from, from, from. <laughs> well, you could make ice cream all day long. <laughs> yeah. That took you all the way through approximately 1943, didn't it? Yeah, 44. Up to 44. 
And now you, they sent you back into active In, duty? Into the Navy as a seaman. Because <laughs> I, I never had a right because I was running the ice cream joint. And, and what were you on now? I was on an aircraft carrier, the Ca Casablanca, USS Casablanca. CV what? Uh, a 55. 55. And I think I see in some of your notes they called it the Kaiser Coffins. Kaiser's Coffins, yeah. Because made by Henry Kaiser. Right, yeah. right. And Why they, were they called that? Well, they figured they were going to be expendable. They didn't have any armor on them, you know, plating armor. They were just hulls of like a cargo ship to, well, actually bef they were going to use them like carrying planes and everything, but they and they're also for sub duty out in the North Atlantic. Was this one of the smaller carriers that mm -hmm. held uh, but it was TBFs the, and a few other planes? Well, were, it was built as a carrier. Yeah. It wasn't a converted cargo ship. It was a carrier that he built, and he built 55 of them in one year. When he built the 105 to the 105. And you were out on a carrier now in 1944. To for the end of the war, forty-five. And where did yeah. where did you go on this thing? Actually, we if you had good duty for a year, uh, when I got on board the ship, I was a seaman, and of course seamen lug everything, you know. And, I, and when you're in the navy as long as I was, and you're saying I got to do something, I got to get out of this division, you know, I got to get something. I didn't realize that they had a ship service right. Somewhere along the line, nobody, nobody said anything about. I had two years of ship service, you know. But then what happened? And this is a this is still would amaze me. And for the fact that when we left, okay, now the ship is leaving Astoria, Oregon, going going Astoria, Oregon, going up to Tacoma, Washington. It left was leaving port, went over the PA system, is there anybody on board that thinks they can steer their ship? Well, yeah, that would be a good idea, wouldn't it? So, <laughs> Did you volunteer for that? So anyway, I first I said, you know, mm, you know, I volunteered but before to stay on board and look what happened to me, but anyway, I the second time I came over, I, I I said, Dad. and the, and the fellow was with me, some other fellow, and said, so why don't you go up to it? You can steer it. I said, yeah, I know. Well, I went out, and uh, the executive officer wanted to know who I was, and I said, N -n -n we didn't know our first name for four years in the Navy. It was always Doyle, whatever your rate was, you know. Seaman first class, sir. He said, you think you can steer this ship? I said, yes, sir. Well, you might as well try it. Nobody else can. Anyway, I got on the wheel and brought it in, brought it on course. And you wound up in Toledo, Ohio, but they... <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> and I just stayed on there for the, all the trip. That's how you got your job? Well, I volunteer? became a quartermaster through that. You named the, the uh, number 55, the CV-855. Was there a name to the ship? Casablanca. Ca I'm the sorry, you did, you did say that. And you're up in Tacoma, Washington now. Now for a year, they yeah. now my job as, as a quartermaster, the the division officer, the the navigator, the assistant navigator, cut me aside after I had steered the ship all the way up the coast. In fact, they brought the food up to me, sandwiches or whatever, while I was on the wheel. After we got into port. He got me aside and asked me how long I was in the Navy, and he said, how come, Leo? And I told him that I, you know, that I was running the E-Dunk, and, you know, I was not, I just was doing what I had to do. I said, I was as happy as a, cl a clam there. But anyway, he says, how would you like to come in the quartermasters? We need you in there. So I said, yes. So his, his assistant was a, said, we got to get you rated, Doyle. He said, it's an exam. We'll give you an exam next month. So he told me what to study for it. I made third right away. And as soon as I was eligible, I was second. As soon as I was eligible, I made first. So I made first class in that year and a half I was on there. So I come out and 
I come out as a first class quartermaster out of the Navy. When you guys went ashore and you're, you're dressed up in your blues, um, you're wearing your ribbons and the other guys look at you and they see a purple heart there in the Pacific uh, Theater. Uh, how about the other people you were sailing with? Did they have as much experience as you? Not that cargo ship, I mean not the uh, aircraft carrier, because they were, actually I was like pop to some of them, when you were four or five years older than them, you were pop. Yeah. They were kids now coming in 16 and 17 years old. But they're looking at your ribbons too. Yeah. Oh yeah. And seeing this guy's been around. Yeah, that's why you, when I was, when I got charge of the division, when you were second class, when you were first class, you were in charge of the division because the chief was always down in the chief quarters and you, you had to learn how to become chief. That's basically what it was. And uh, I used to tell the guys that were under me, look, when I give you an order to do something, do it, because I didn't make the thing up. Somebody told me to do it. So if you think I'm going to get in trouble because of you, you're crazy. So you better do it, get what I ask you to do, and we'll get along fine. So we got along fine. But my job was to train for a whole year. I trained helmsmen to go on the other ships, the, car, the aircraft carriers, because they were better than we, better off than us because we came on board, we knew who knew nothing was. When they came on board, they used to come on for two weeks of training. Uh, we would have, we started out with one crew, uh, like a cadre from another ship. And they got acquainted, there's certain machinists and whatever, they, they, different rates were on board so that they would become familiar with the ship. So that when they went on their ship, they knew where every station was. So we did that for the whole 55 ships. We also, I was training, I think, uh, six helmsmen, three from each ship. Uh, we always had two ships on board. One would leave, another one would come on. When you're a member of a class of ships, Essex class, Casablanca class, whatever, mm. Do you particularly watch to see where your classmates go and the guys you train? Do you know where the ships go and if they get in harm's way, if they were part of some big battle someplace? Yeah, we, we did. How did you hear about them? Well, we'd find out that the, that the certain carriers got sunk. The Philippines, there were three of them sunk, I think. And we found out, and we all knew some of them were on board those ships, and we knew their names at that time. Plus, fifty some odd years later, you forget. But yeah. we did know at that time certain ones that I trained because we found out. You know, we'd see the crew someplace where we would be, uh, or we'd would ask somebody how they made out, things like that. How yeah. far afield did you go in the Casablanca? Where did you go? Well, we went out to uh, New Guinea. We went to. Um, uh, the Philippines, we went to Tinian, Guam, Saipan, but we were, we were, actually what we did most on that was we used to come back and pick up a load of planes and go right back out again. So well, you we, were taxiing planes out, we, you, were, you were just carrying, not, not operational? We weren't operational, carrier. we yeah. were more of a, of a supply, we would come back and pick up I think around 40 planes and bring them out. And then we'd come right back and pick up 40 more. And uh, there's there no way they could fly them out there. They had to come back then. You mentioned Saipan, you mentioned uh, Tinian, the Philippines. Well, the Philippines. Where, where was the war in relation to the beaches that you get to, went to then? Well, they were, they were after the fact, rather than they were already secure. Yeah. Uh, there was still some fighting. On, we were in Samar in the Philippines. There was still some fighting there that hadn't surrendered yet, but we weren't anywhere near it. I never saw the enemy at all after we got on there any time, not even a plane. Where were you when the war ended? Tinian. At Tinian? Yeah. And when the war ended, if you were there and you looked out and seen the ships that were around you, as far as your eye could see, we were actually getting ready for the invasion. We didn't know that, but we knew something was up. Was that still a big B-29 base? Did you 
see operational planes going out of there. We used to see planes a lot, but we didn't yeah. pay much attention to them. Other as long as they, they weren't the other guys. I mean, we knew our own planes. Are you saying that uh, at Tinian, that far removed from the uh, southern islands, fleets were gathering then for the invasion? For the invasion of, uh, for uh, the invasion of Japan. Yeah. Did you think you would be part of that then? At the moment, no. You know, we didn't. We knew they were there. We just thought there were other islands we were going to go. But that's when we really. Yeah. That was towards the end of the war, and, and there was no other reason for them being there other than to for the invasion. We would have been part of it also. Tell us about going home. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> the uh, excuse me. The uh, we all got out on point systems. You must have been loaded with points. I had points coming up in your ears. Yes. I could have given half of the ship yeah. points. And they knew it. They used to say, boy, I wish I had some of them, Doyle. You know? Yeah. You're, you're lucky so-and-so, you're going to get out of this. So-and-so, yeah. And uh, at that point in time, I, you know, you hear things said about war. And if they'd have blown Japan off the face of the earth, it wouldn't have bothered us one moment. because. Actually, we had a slogan out there at the time, the Golden Gate by 48. That's when we thought we were going to get home. We, we had no idea it was going to, until those two bombs dropped. Otherwise, we would have been still out there. When were you discharged? October the 3rd. Of 40? Of 45. Of 45? At 10 o'clock in the morning. After four years, five months, three days, and 10 hours. So I said, uh, two days and ten hours. That's a long and time. And you went home back up to uh, Cambridge? Well, I got married when I was in the service. You did? Yeah. So where where did you? Tacoma, Washington. I met my wife there in Tacoma, Washington. And did you go back to the West Coast or to the East Coast? No, uh, I went out to, um, I got discharged in Chicago. Great Lakes? Great Lakes. Yeah. And I met the old skipper that was on board. He got the Navy Cross. He was commanding the, the Great Lakes uh, Station. And I went over. I took a chance while I was there. I was only there three days. And I took a chance and went over and asked the Marine that was out in front of the door. And, you know, I said, that, that's um, Admiral Freeman. Was he, was he on the El Chiba, do you know? He said, no, but I wouldn't find out. And he went in, and out came the admiral. Well, you think we were long lost brothers? He asked me a lot of in you a know, sense questions. you were. Yeah, he knew yeah. I had heard and everything, and um, he was. And he said that you know he was, he was a commander in the navy, and um, he said that you know because of you fellows, he Annapolis grad, and because of us. Uh, he got the Navy Cross, and then he would make captain, and then he made admiral. So he said, "You guys did one hell of a job for us." For me, he said, "Cause I was in a little bit of trouble. I don't know what trouble he was in, but that's how he got the cargo ship. I guess he wanted a destroyer. Or, you know, they, the, the brass wanted a big ship. They didn't want no cargo ship. But well, the cargo ships." If, if it hadn't been for you guys, the rest of the war couldn't have gone on. That's one way to look at it, too. Well, we did our job. And, and you know, we, like I said, we didn't know we were as expendable, because we were always under fire whenever we went in. And a couple of times we were starting in, and we had to turn around. One time, uh, the Meredith got sunk. The destroyer was with us, and they had a, a big row uh, Seagull and Tug, and there were two, the Bella Goose and my, and ourselves, were, and we had a, we were towing a load of aviation gasoline along with the ship being loaded with aviation gas. We had to cut the cable and take off because they, they were coming after us. And um, this particular time, they, three planes, four, four planes, got it within our range and tried to hit us. They, they were so close that the, in the bow of the ship that when the bombs fell, the guys that were on the, the three-inch guns up forward were soaking wet from the water, but that's how close they missed the ship. But 
they didn't hit us. We were fortunate at that time. But the Meredith uh, picked up the crew of the of the Vigoro, and they just left the Vigoro out there with with the barge with the gasoline. They took them on, and they were coming towards us when the Japs hit them and sunk them, sunk the Meredith. And but then they went after us. There were two cargo ships. But they just spended all their gas and everything when they hit the Meredith. We were we were fortunate because as soon as they dropped their bombs, they took off. And we we think that we got one of the four because the last thing we saw was smoke trailing from one of the planes that were taken away. You know, because we were firing everything at them. Yeah. You know? What's there in this long career that you've described to us this morning? Uh, was there a most memorable experience, one that comes up in your mind more than anything else? Well, I, I still think of that sinking of the the, um, the Astoria. Astoria yeah. and all the guys that we... That would be very graphic, seeing mm -hmm. a ship yeah. turn like that. What about a, a character, some guy uh, that you served with? Somebody that you remember when you think oh, about that time? I, I go back to Pappy Shar. Uh, he was uh, from Somerville, Massachusetts, I believe. He was World War I. He was an ensign then. And he knew Halsey, Admiral Halsey. Really? Then. In fact, Halsey came on board and awarded us the presidential citation and the, the guys that won the Navy Cross and the, and the Silver Stars. And, and I often wonder, you know, they were sort of tight with their decorations back then, because I've seen fellas do some things that I saw, we were down in a hole in number three hole, uh, pouring water on the bulkhead from number two while we're unloading small arm ammunition up hand by hand out of that hole, so, you know. You that takes one, guts. Yeah. The temptation is to get out of there. Yeah, and then, like I say, they, I think it was three, Three of our seamen, three of the sailors, uh, enlisted men, got medals, and four of the officers got medals. With uh, when you were discharged, with what what was your rank? First class quarterman. And what medals did you have? No, we did, we had the age, you know the ones that were awarded the Pacific, the Purple Heart, the Presidential Citation. The, Asiatic. We had the Atlantic medal also, the Pacific medal. We had about four or four medals in the reward that was over. We got some sort of accommodation that's in our record, um, but I think it was just from the captain for the work that we did on board the ship. But I don't think there's a medal attached to it. Did you join any Naval Reserve units? Like, uh, <laughs> no way. No. When, when it was over, they brought us into Chicago to, to become civilians for three days. And while we were there, they were starting to call us by our first name, and we, that concerned me a little bit. They, they were, were being too very, nice. They were being friendly, right? Oh, being yeah. friendly. You know, sit down, they had cigars and cigarettes there. Anything we wanted was for us, you know? But you didn't ship over. And then they asked us at, at one point, any, and they were talking up the Naval Reserve, keep your rate. Well, I knew what they could do at my rate, but I can't say it here, but I, I couldn't wait to, to, to get out. And uh, I thought I was pretty fast when they said all those that aren't interested in the, in the reserves can leave. I thought I was pretty fast leaving, but there was a few guys ahead of me <laughs> get out that door. They wanted no part of it. You know, after, after five years, yeah. four and a half years, you... They, they kind of put you down as doubtful, I think. <laughs> I think so. I think so. How important to you was serving in the military? Um, well, it's an experience that, that, that it would be nice, in a way, to see CCs, as I spoke about before, was leading into that, and the fact that you had the responsibility that you mightn't have got any place else. In, you're in charge of things at a young age, and it, it led into um, taking responsible positions and, and uh, you know, doing a better job, really, because of the experience. I think it, it wouldn't hurt 
a lot of these young people today to get a, to be a, a, a little taste of um, military service. Uh, the, the, they learn discipline, they learn respect. A lot of them are lacking that today. And right now it's almost like Christmas out, everybody's friendly, but most of the time what they say to you and the fingers they give you and, the, and they have no respect for anyone. You can walk in a door and they let it slam in front of your face. And if you hold the door open for some of these people today, I can hold it. My, I can open it myself. Pardon me, madam, but I said to one of them, but this is how I was trained as a child. So you see that and, you know, so we, we went through this and we, in Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, we're in his book, that Kerry Corner group. We have a chapter in there. So. They asked us those kind of questions. What do you think of the country today as what it was 50 years ago? And most of us said respect and discipline isn't there. I think you can remember coming home uh, from World War II and, and, and probably being well received and welcomed home. And uh, with, with thanks for your service, do you feel there's a difference uh, between the reception you got and what the guys and, and women got who served in Korea or Vietnam? Well, my son was in Vietnam and I, I told him to join the Navy. If you're not going to go to school, at least join the Navy. You won't be over in a godforsaken place. You'll be doing your job. He certainly did. He had two river boats blown out from under him while he was out there in Vietnam. And when we came home, it was great. Of course, we came home a month or so after the war was over and things were back pretty much to normal, I suppose. Because I just said to one of my neighbors the other day, I didn't see what the United States was like when war was declared because I was in Iceland. And I didn't see what the United States was like when the war was over because I was in the Pacific in Tinian. So I missed this is the way it is today, it was then. You know, how proud they were. And now, you know, and right now you see flags flying all over the place, you know. And it, it's nice to see that, and, it, and it's, but, uh, but up until this point, you know, you got the Irish salute many a time in Florida, because we had, I have Massachusetts plates on, why don't you go home, we, you know. Where you come from, yeah. Yeah. Did you uh, take advantage of any of the benefits after the war, the uh, a GI Bill, or uh, of course you got more hospitalization than you were looking for, but uh, insurance or anything else like that? No, I went to work. I came back and went right to work, and I had, I was an apprentice when I left, and I had a a year and a half left to serve as an apprentice, but because of of uh, fellows like myself, we brought it down to four years apprenticeship. So I became a journeyman six months later. When we started this, you said you had gone to Harvard. Yeah, I, I, in the union I became a, before I, I was an officer in the local union. So I started, the, the, they have a labor school in Boston it, it used to be the Catholic Labor you know, School of Labor. And they changed it. It's an industrial uh, labor school because there's a, all nominations, religious nominations, go there. And um, I spent three or four, when, when you, I felt if you're an officer, you gotta learn something about what you're doing or, or help in what you're doing, like public speaking and that type of thing. And, different labor laws and Taft-Hartley and whatever. And, and then while I was there, they told me there was a scholarship um, at Harvard. Uh, they have a labor school at the business school in Harvard. And uh, I applied for the scholarship and I wound up, I got a scholarship to Harvard for 13 weeks over the business school. Good for you. And then Right after that, a few years later, I became an international representative with the printing, uh, the book binders, and I retired as an international rep when I retired. 
We're almost through here, Leo, and I, I wanted to ask you at least one final question. Um, is, is there one thought or one incident above all in, in, your, in a long career where you got pretty badly hurt that you would like to tell us about today? You mean when I got hit in the service? Whatever. What, is there well, something that stands out in your mind? That, that was an experience because the, when, at the time when you got hurt, you know, you didn't know what, a, what, you, what, what the future was going to be as far as, you know, when my back was broken and, and uh, trying to get home. Get away from that area for a while. Um, the, the I, I don't know really. I like I say when you go back in moments of time, it's um, just the fact that you survived all of this. I guess is, and you, sometimes you wonder why you're still around, you know, and see the things that have happened to our country or see whatever. That's I just. Day to day, I, I I keep going. I make these pins. I've been making them for five years, and I brought them along to to, to give you fellows when, or whoever I'm going to run into over here. Oh, it, 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 it isn't that I started it yesterday. I started that six years ago, and I still give them out. So you can give this to the cameraman over there. If he, Thank you very much. You know. Because yeah. I figured, you know, for the life you live, you got to give something back somehow. And that's my way, I guess, of giving back, because I don't sell these. I won't accept money for them. And I'm in my 600 gross of pins, so I've been, there's got people wearing my flag today that are living on the West Coast, down south, North Dakota, wherever I've been. You've been busy. But I give them in the airline, see? Leo I, Doyle. Thank you for coming in today. May the wind be at your back. Thank you.